I'd like to begin our time today with a reading from the Old Testament book of Job, Job chapter 7. Uh, follow along if you like, or just listen. And I want you to pay a special attention to what Job says here. Job chapter 7. Is not man forced to labor on earth, and are not his days like the days of a hired man? As a slave who pants for the shade, as a hired man who eagerly waits for his wages, so I am allotted months of vanity, and nights of trouble are appointed me. When I lie down, I say, when shall I rise? But the night continues, and I am continually tossing until dawn. My flesh is clothed with worms and a crust of dirt. My skin hardens and runs. My days are swifter than a weaver's shuttle and come to an end without hope. Remember that my life is but a breath. My eye will not see good. The eye of him who sees me will behold me no longer. Your eyes will be on me, but I will not be. When a cloud vanishes, it is gone. So he who goes down to Sheol does not come up. He will not return again to his house, nor will his place know him any more. Therefore, I will not restrain my mouth. I will speak in the anguish of my spirit. I will complain in the bitterness of my soul. Am I the sea or a sea monster that you set a guard over me? If I say my bed will comfort me, my couch will ease my complaint, then you frighten me with dreams and terrify me by vision so that my soul would choose suffocation, rather death rather than my pain. I waste away. I will not live forever. Leave me alone, for my days are but a breath. What is man that you magnify him and that you are concerned about him, that you examine him every morning and try him every moment? Will you never turn your gaze away from me, nor let me alone until I swallow my spittle? Have I sinned? What have I done to you, O watcher of men? Why have you set me as your target, so that I am a burden to myself? Why then do you pardon, not pardon my iniqu Start again. Why then do you not pardon my transgression and take away my iniquity? For now I will lie down in the dust, and you will seek me, but I will not be. Those are sobering words, aren't they? And they're words from someone in the grip of great pain and agony and suffering. That's the story of Job, isn't it? Don't have time right now in this lesson to rehearse all of that, but you know the story well enough. Job was hurting, and he was crying out, pouring out his soul to God, and, and uh, just grieving with all of that. I read that chapter just to set up our discussion for today and some lessons to follow. But what are we going to do about the problem of suffering? It's very real. Perhaps you're suffering right now in one way or another and are seeking some answers. Perhaps you've heard the word theodicy. That's a fancy term of philosophy. I'll define it for you. Theodicy is a branch of philosophy dealing with the issue of evil and suffering in the light of the existence of God. It's, it's been a question for centuries. How do you square the fact that there's so much evil and suffering in the world, yet claim to believe in the existence of God? If God is just and holy and good, as the Bible proclaims him to be, then how do evil and misery exist? That's the question theodicy wrestles with. The word itself, you pick up the word for God in it, theo, that's God, and decay, uh, D-I-K-E, theodicy, that is the word for righteousness or justness. So we've got a, a concern here for the justice of God. How can God be righteous? How can God be who he is and still allow evil to go on? History's most famous statement of the problem of evil comes from the ancient Greek philosopher Epicurus. He put it this way, and there's various forms of it, but he says, Is God willing to prevent evil but not able? Then he is not omnipotent or all-powerful. If he is able or all-powerful but not willing, then he is malevolent. If God has the power, he's saying, and doesn't stop it, then God himself is evil. Is he both able and willing? Is God both omnipotent and, and willing to do but won't? Then whence comes the evil? Where does evil come from? Is he neither able nor willing? Then why call him God? So you, you feel the tension there. And again, this is something philosophers and 
and religious teachers have struggled with. It's something atheists latch onto and, and use that to deny the existence of God. And then the battle goes on today. Well, my purpose in this lesson, the ones that are going to follow, Lord willing, is not to address the problem of evil as it relates to the existence of God. I'm not here to deal with the theodicy problem. We're going to proceed with the assumption that there are adequate answers to that question, and there are. You know, how can evil and, and pain and suffering exist, and yet God still exists? Uh, I think there are adequate answers to that. We're just going to assume that from, uh, from this vantage point. And again, there's, there's some good reasons why we can assume that. Instead, though, we're going to be considering other questions related to the problem of evil and suffering. <clears throat> Some questions like this. What do we have to do or what do we do with the suffering we experience as well as we see around us? What are we going to do with that? How are we going to deal with it? Is pain senseless? Is there any value in suffering? I struggled for a while even choosing that as a title for these series of lessons. If you noticed in the bulletin, uh, this is lesson number one in the series entitled The Value of Suffering. Uh, I, I tried to find a better word for that, but uh, I couldn't come up with one, so we're going to go with that. But is there any value in suffering? Seeing a purpose in suffering and pain, I believe, can help us to deal with it. If it... You know, it's this idea of the senselessness of it all that, that really strikes deep in our soul. So if there's a way we can find a purpose in undergoing what we all do in one form or another or see around us, then maybe we can uh, help each other to deal with that. I'm not saying, of course, that it takes it away or lessens it. Even if we come up with some good reasons to show the value or benefits that suffering can bring, Again, I'm not saying that it'll, it'll take away all the pain or even maybe lessen it in some way, but perhaps it can make it endurable. Uh, let me just use one example to, to show perhaps how this idea, if we can just see a purpose in it, then that will help. Uh, let's just imagine, you know, I'm a grandfather and I've taken one of my grandchildren on a walk in, in a park somewhere. We're enjoying a, a beautiful day. Uh, one another's presence and talking and, and uh, playing on the playground equipment, all of that good thing. But out of nowhere, a vicious dog comes running toward us. And uh, as a grandfather, I've got a choice to make, don't I? Do I stand back and let my grandchild be attacked and, and be harmed by a vicious dog? Or do I step in and willingly uh, deal with all of that? Well, of course, the answer would be, you know, I'm going to stand in there and the dog can bite me if he wants to bite someone, but not not my grandchild. Again, and I, I'm willing to do that because my love for the grandchild, aren't I? I'm willing to endure that pain because I can see a purpose in it. I'm protecting someone that's that can't defend themselves. So that's perhaps one example of, of uh, again, you can see some some purpose in the pain. I can think of another example. Uh, several years ago, my father was at uh, the MD Anderson Hospital in, in Houston, Texas, battling the cancer that he had. And as part of that process, he needed, I, I believe it was platelets uh, for a blood transfusion to help with all of that. And, and uh, you know, I, I don't care much for needles. But anyway, you know, they were looking for donors to go be hooked up to a machine and and to donate that. So I was willing to do that for the sake of my father. And you know, they stuck a needle in one arm and they put a needle in the other one and, and pumped blood out, and run it through their fancy machine, and then pumped it back in. Well, again, there wasn't a lot of pain associated with that necessarily and suffering, but, uh, you know, again... I was willing to add a purpose for doing that, for going through the, the pokes and, and the issues with all of that. So again, those are some illustrations to show that at least that helps with the problem, doesn't it? There's a point to it all. Sometimes an answer to the why question helps out. And I'm not going to be to offer everything that's perhaps going to 
answer every question in your mind. There may be some whys that aren't as obvious as the illustrations we just uh, I just shared with you, right? Again, protecting a defenseless person, that's a pretty obvious why. But maybe there's some other whys as far as the, the benefits that come that can give us some purpose in seeing why we're going through what we, we have to endure. As we consider the value of suffering in subsequent lessons, and I have a list of several that we'll you know, take one by one and, and get your input on. But as we consider those things in Sundays ahead, we're going to be discussing some of these less obvious ways that suffering can have meaning. But before we do that, and the purpose of this lesson today is to do some preliminary things uh, to, to set up what we will be talking about. And I need to make some things crystal clear as we begin this discussion. First of all, we're not downplaying your pain and suffering or anyone else's down or any anyone else's pain or suffering as well. The last thing I would want to do is is somehow make uh, make it seem like well, yeah, you're going through things, but it's no big deal. It's not that at all. Whatever you're going through or what someone else is going through is it's very real. It hurts perhaps intensely. Life is full of those situations where, you know, uh, we suffer. That's part of the sin-filled world that we live in. So we're not discounting any of that at all. Please don't take these efforts to provide some of the whys, to examine some of the values that come with suffering. Please don't take them to reflect on the value of suffering as a minimization of what you're going through. Not at all. Not at all. I'm not saying, of course, that you shouldn't feel the way you feel. That's uh, not, a, not a helpful thing at all. For someone to approach someone going through a terrible time of suffering and says, well, you shouldn't feel that way. Here's some good things that can come out of it. Well, that's, that's not a good approach. Can't deny what you're, you're going through. The Bible, of course, is full of the anguished cries of those who were suffering. Job chapter 7 that we began the lesson with is just one of those out of many that we could point to. Many of the Psalms are the, the anguished outpouring of a, of a hurting and suffering heart. Where are you, God? Why is this happening to me? We affirm that. We can affirm that. And you've probably been in a time in your life when you've shared some of those cries with God. So the Bible understands that. Maybe you're not at a point where you want to hear about any value in what you're going through. I understand that. I've been there, and, and probably you have as well. The last thing you want is someone coming to you and, and necessarily maybe trying to make you feel better about all of that. As I mentioned a moment ago, I struggled to, to find a different word than value. I thought about benefit, but again, that's the same idea. Maybe what we're going to talk about will be helpful at some later point. If, you, if, if you're not at a point right now that that would be helpful to you, I, I, I get it. But maybe, you know, you can hear these things and, and later when you reach a point where they can be helpful, then maybe uh, you can think about that some more. So we're not trying to downplay your pain saying these things or trying to show some of the value that can come with those bad times in life is, is never for the purpose of, of saying, well, we don't appreciate what you're going through and we, we may not even fully understand it. So I want to make that crystal clear. There's another thing I want to make crystal clear as well. And that's that if you're not suffering right now, and praise God for that, but if you're not suffering right now and are eager to help a hurting or suffering person, and we're grateful for, for an intention to do that as well, I, I would counsel those in that situation. If you're not suffering and want to help someone else, please be wise as you share what we're going to be learning. And this is really the flip side. As I've just said, I want to be uh, sympathetic to those who are hurting, but I also have some counsel for those who are wanting to help. 
because you need to do that the right way as well. Here's some things I would just caution you as if you want to be a helper, if you want to draw alongside a person that needs some help dealing with their suffering. First of all, I would encourage you to navigate that situation very, very carefully. And chances are, if you've ever been in a position where you're hurting and suffering in a, in a very real and intense way, then, then you've probably been approached by someone who wasn't a lot of help <laughs> in the way that they tried to uh, be sensitive. But So you need to navigate very carefully. Walk softly. Be sensitive to that hurting person. Again, just marching in with you know, all of your advice on how to deal with a problem or how it can be valuable to them, uh, that's, you've got to be very careful. Timing in this type of things is critical. It's probably not something that, uh, you know, if you, you go into the hospital and perhaps they've just come out of surgery after, you know, a wreck, uh, and they're finally woke up from the anesthesia, that's probably not the best time to launch into something like this. So pick your times carefully. I would encourage us all in that situation to share compassionately, not condescendingly. There's a difference, isn't there, between compassion and condescension. Compassion would draw alongside a person, and uh, condescending would maybe do that, but yet kind of talk down. Well, if if you were a better Christian, you'd realize that there's some value in what you're going through. Well, there may be a kernel of truth in that, but the way you say that, the way you approach that, if you're, if you're coming from, and try, it, it makes a person feel worse. It adds, in fact, to that suffering. So be compassionate. Perhaps these type of situations, you're wanting to help a hurting person and you've learned some things that can show how suffering can be valuable if approached in the right way, but maybe even that is best handled on an invitation-only basis. Perhaps the best way is to wait until that person maybe asks for those kind of, that kind of help. I mean, you can march in and do it Im immediately and maybe some good can come from that. My guess would be that that uh, it's probably going to be more harmful than good. But there may come a time in the midst of, of suffering where, the again, the person is, is pouring out their heart to you and, and a door opens where you can say, well, have you ever thought about this? So, again, if you're not suffering and want to be helpful to a hurting person, be very, very wise in how you do that. I would conclude this introductory lesson to this series by just reminding us of, of one thing. Again, you may be listening to this and you're in a period of intense suffering right now. And I pray on your behalf that God will somehow heal you if possible. But maybe you've been there and, and you're wondering, why am I going through this? Well, Perhaps none of what I share in these lessons you'll find helpful. I hope that you do. But perhaps I can just remind you of the fact of, of just the fact that Jesus himself knows what suffering's about. Your Savior, if you're a Christian, your Savior knows something about suffering. Just one verse in particular, Matthew chapter 16, verse 21. And if you know the Gospels, you know the life of Jesus was filled with his share of pain and suffering, the very Son of God knows what it's all about. Matthew 16, 21 says, From that time Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised up on the, on the third day. And you could point to other verses that make the same point, but Jesus knows what suffering is all about. May not be your exact kind of suffering, but yours isn't exactly like his. But the point is, Jesus knows. Your Savior knows what it is like to hurt. We follow a Savior who knows all about suffering. Even if none of our other questions are answered about dealing with suffering, you know, how does it all fit together? Why, God? Even if none of those questions are answered, we can take some amount of solace in the fact that we follow a Savior who does know what it's like, and he's there for you and I and for anyone else 
in the midst of your pain, when it perhaps seems like everyone else has abandoned you and you seem totally alone, please know that your Savior is there for you. Won't necessarily mean your pain is taken away, but perhaps that one fact alone will, will help to make it bearable in some measure. I pray that these words are encouraging to you. Again, if you're hurting, I pray that God will be with you. And if possible, uh, tune in again as we work our way and, and talk about some of these things. I believe there are some good biblical reasons to know why there is a benefit in, in suffering. It may be that we see these things through the tears of that pain and suffering. But as we talked about earlier, if we can at least get a sense of the why, perhaps that'll help us deal with the what that, that we're facing. So God bless, and I pray that uh, you can consider these things and uh, follow with us as we continue to talk about this issue. Have a great day.